Um, okay, let's let's go ahead and begin. Um, welcome to everybody who's joining us. Uh, I'm Dale Doherty with Make, and uh, we're joined here with uh, 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 Neil Gershenfeld and numerous others. Here, we'll we'll introduce them as as we go here, but. Uh, uh, Neil is uh, from MIT Center of Bits and Atoms, uh, a creator of Fab Labs, and uh, also joined by Sherry Lassiter, who's the executive director of the Fab Foundation. So we'll be talking about uh, what the Fab Labs uh, are doing, what, what Neil's group is doing uh, with COVID-19. And But I, I want to actually start off by asking Neil a question that, in many ways, what we see happening today, the idea that digital designs can go almost anywhere, be designed anywhere, and move anywhere across networks, and be replicated by having the same machines or similar machines in different places. Really, this sort of idea of localized production uh, and replication is, 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 I think, his idea. Uh, uh, maybe you got it from somewhere else, but it's certainly expressed in your book in, in around 2005 in FAB and led to the formation of FAB Labs. So what, what was the origin, uh, what were you thinking about that led you to see what Fab Labs, sh why you should build Fab Labs? Oh, that's, oh the origin story, I see. So um, yeah, so my day job now is I direct this program, Center for Bits and Atoms, that looks very fundamentally at how digital meets physical. And so we did early things like some of the first quantum computers were part of creating synthetic life. But what it really came out of is, let, oh, in, in high school, I wanted to go to vocational school because you got, learned to weld and fix cars. And I was told, no, you're smart. You have to sit in a room. And nobody could explain to me why, if you're smart, you have to sit in a room and you can't weld. And um, when I was a technician at Bell Labs, I had union grievances because I would try to go into the workshops and make things. And they said, no, you're smart. You have to tell somebody what to do. And, and I just never understood this until... You know, I finally reached the point of you know, with colleagues starting this lab at MIT and came to understand that this was all just a mistake from the Renaissance, that, that the liberal and the illiberal arts were separated and making was, was, was an illiberal art separated, but the means of expression have changed. Um, and so, so all my life I've been fighting that battle. I just didn't have the words for it. Um, but that still doesn't explain. In a minute, I'll explain how th that thought led to Fab Lab. So I always struggled against this boundary of digital and physical and a combination of colleagues, MIT, NSF made it possible to create a lab where um, what we put together was one of every machine to make anything of any size roughly. So from molecules up to buildings, we have all of those tools. And what's emerged from that is this research roadmap that you know, there's one earth, a thousand cities, a billion people, a trillion, um, uh, sorry, uh, a billion people, trillion things. Computers went from one to a thousand to a million to a billion and trillion. What's emerging in the research is the same sort of robot, uh, roadmap. MIT invented NC machining in 1952. Um, it spawned Fab Labs I'll talk about in a minute that spawned machines making machines to assemblers to self-assemblers. And so we're running this research roadmap of how to make a, a trillion fab labs, literally in the same way that Internet of Things is making so a trillion PDP computers. And um, the path to fab lab, so that was sort of bits meets atoms. The path to fab labs was, we had all these machines and it would take a lifetime to learn how to use them. So I started with colleagues, a class modestly called how to make almost anything just on how to use all these tools and wasn't prepared for every year hundreds of students show up begging to get into the class and saying things like this seems too useful are you allowed to teach it at MIT or all my life I've been waiting for this class and they did the most amazing things like Kelly made a device to save up screens and place it back later later and this is a dress that defends your personal space and this amazing personal expression in fabrication and so we're fab labs grew from that was actually something completely mercenary. Uh, Congress passed a bill that big research grants need to show social impact. And so they told the NSF, show social impact. NSF didn't know how to do it. So they told people like me, uh, show social impact. I didn't know how to do it, but we just thought the machines were cool. So rather than telling people, we thought we'd set up a mini version of the lab. You know, it, if you go back to this picture here, uh, the, the PDP 
weighed a few tons, cost $100,000 and filled a room, but did everything you need to do to personalize computing and was used to invent email and the internet and video games and all of that. In the same sense, while we turn the fab lab into something that fits in your pocket with programmable materials, literally, the, uh, uh, the fab lab is a mini version of the lab at MIT. It's about two tons, $100,000. It has a 3D printer, but all the other machines to make functional things. And with those tools, you can make everything up here, boats, bicycles, furniture, consumer electronics. And then we had this accident, they went viral. We set up one in inner city Boston, a Ghanaian connection led to Sakandi Takaradi, a connection there led to Pretoria, another connection led to above the Arctic Circle. And every year they started doubling. And you know, we didn't think of that, it's the world's response. The, this top graph is Gordon Moore's five points for Moore's law. What he got wrong was it was 50 years. This is uh, 50 years of Intel processor scaling. Uh, Sherry Lassiter, who you'll meet who runs the Fab Lab Network has many skills, but the hygiene of her desk isn't one of them. She has piles of paper. And she noticed the piles of paper for I want a Fab Lab started doubling. And then we started plotting, and this is the doubling of Fab Labs over a decade. And it's actually more data than Gordon Moore had. So this has come to be called um, Lass's Law. Uh, this is a book I wrote with my younger brother, Alan, who ran the video game studio at Activision, and my other, older brother, Joel, who ran the National Labor Relations Organization, about what, what does it mean for that to scale 50 years technically, and then how to not wait 50 years for spam and fake news and all the other issues we've had in the first digital revolutions, but try to shape it now. Uh, so in that scaling, uh, my lab has done a lot of work on making the machines. These are companies we were part of spinning off to make rapid prototyping more widely accessible, but that wasn't really the point. The, really, the goal was for the machines to make machines, rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping. So a series of students have been developing the technology for that. The most recent version, this is work of a student, Jake, where you have parametric machine generators, but then what's so interesting about the way he builds machines are, this isn't what it looks like. It's actually a distributed data flow network that does message passing in hardware where you overlay message passing in software to make virtual machines control physical machines for rapid machine building. And one of the interesting trends in the fab lab is that lets you make a lab for an order of magnitude cheaper, but you need the machines to make the parts of those machines. And so we've been helping groups set up million dollar super fab labs with the machines you need to make $10,000 mini labs. And this is one of the first of those. This is in uh, Kerala in the south of India. The next one we're doing in, is in Bhutan, which is based around gross national happiness and trying to make that um, physically embodied. And so to keep up with all of that sca scaling, like the class at MIT, we had to start a program called Academy, Fab Academy, Bio Academy, Textile Academy, to teach these skills, not online, not at a central site, but distributed work groups locally connected globally learning these skills. Um, we had to spin off organizations like the Fab Foundation, Fab Labs IO, you'll hear more about. And that's led to things like, uh, this is Barcelona's mayor, fabulous design sense in Barcelona, 50% youth unemployment, whole generation can't work. He's starting a 40 year countdown to urban self-sufficiency. If you live in the city, you can produce what you consume. Instead of products going in and trash going out, data goes in and out, but the means of production are part of the city. All these other cities have joined that initiative. Um, this is a lab we ran with Megan, who you'll meet at the Obama White House, and Dale and others on this call were there. That's led to really interesting legislation uh, to look at digital fabrication as a right, like computing and communication, for universal access to digital fabrication as a, uh, in the national interest, expanding this universal access. And where all that leads and transitioning now to COVID, to start at the end, uh, it's been both attributed to Ram Emanuel, Winston Churchill, and people hundreds of years before Winston Churchill, the idea of not wasting a crisis. But the opportunity here is not to rebuild where we were, but to really build, di rebuild differently. If you can go, so this is a Fab Lab in Vestmanair, a tiny volcanic island off the coast of Iceland, fabulously equipped. If you can go in there and make all the things I'm showing you, it's not utopia, it's not free, but you could make it for yourself, you could make it for friends or family, you could make it for barter or exchange, you could make it as a small business. There's many different ways to fill in between DIY and mass manufacturing. But all the assumptions we have about jobs equals work equals money and you need tariffs and imports and all of that, 
goes away if you can send bits and produce locally. And there's a real opportunity ultimately in making not just meeting the immediate needs, but really this is a chance to rebuild how society works, basic if assumptions about the economy. And so that leads up to now, with all the tools at CBA, we were approached with suggestions and requests to use them for the response. I put together a little work group to help advise it, and it's exploded to about 150 people. We meet uh, once a week. Everything we do is public. You just, you need to be a member for the internal issue tracking, but all the content is posted. Um, you can see it this league. And it's grown to government, industry, medical, research, NGOs, all collaborating. And then there's a second project that's emerged, which is um, to do the same thing with the Global Fab Lab Network. And the way they relate, this first project assumes access to things like electron microscopes and research hospitals to do the real research on the response. And then um, you don't need access to all those tools to scale and deploy. And the second pro project is looking at how we can use the whole global network to deploy. And so as we lead into the panel, just a few things that have come from it. Um, there's a lot of misinformation and a great need for curation. Um, there's way too many ventilator projects, for example, and a lot of the need isn't ventilators, but it's co what comes before you get on the ventilator. Uh, 3D printers alone can do very little. There's a lot rapid prototyping can do, but just 3D printing is limited in what you can make with it. Um, there's a real emerging need transitioning from PPE to monitoring and testing and the whole uh, chain for that. And so each of these are real research projects that need advanced work to understand them and curate them. And, but then there's this false dichotomy between DIY and volume manufacturing. And one of the most interesting opportunities is to not self-organize, not do it yourself, but sort of collectively organize to take advantage of the distributed production capacity. And so it won't happen by itself, and it also won't happen by command and control. It's exactly in between those and kind of coordinating and collaborating. And so again, both of these are public projects. You're welcome uh, to all of the content in them. And for the session, we pulled together an interesting group now to take a tour. And so the first person I'm gonna introduce is one of my students at MIT, Zach, who's been working on rapid product developing, not just rapid prototyping, but developing the rapid prototyping projects using the tools at MIT. So Zach, take over the screen. Yeah, sure. I think everybody can see uh, my screen. I'm just going to give you guys a, a quick tour of some of the projects that we've been working on at CBA that I've been involved with. Um, and I'm going to go really fast because we have five minutes, so bear with me. Let me get my uh, screen kind of organized. Um, so the first effort that really hit the DIY community that seemed really worth pursuing were making face shields. Um, I got involved early on with a uh, kind of distributed group called the Helpful Engineering Slack channel, which has like 15,000 people on it. So for the first a uh, little bit of time, we uh, basically rapid prototyped and uh, tested a, a lot of different designs that the community was coming up with. We have the equipment that we can very quickly uh, turn this this kind of stuff out. So, um, and I should note Zach, Zach, along with other things, is is um, religious about open the open hardware movement. Yeah, I owe um, a lot of why I'm here to open source hardware. So everything I do, I make every effort to make open, which means uh, sharing design files in a format that can be edited with um, freely available software. I think that's very important. Um, so um, this, this project went through a number of trials at local hospitals. Uh, we had a neoprene band, a rigid piece, and then a cut PETG bit. Um, it kind of wraps around your head and is adjustable, but was expensive. Um, and not terribly comfortable. So um, we were approached by another group at MIT um, that was making a single piece foldable design that's designed to be disposable. Um, so we did a lot of testing for them on our, uh, we have some high speed cutting and folding equipment at CBA. So we worked with them to quickly iterate their design. Um, and they've been scaling this by the millions using commercial die cutting operations. And um, what we did, Kind of two things spun out of that project, which was Project Manus. Before we go on, just two notes about that project. So one of the observations is, in fact, 3D printing is, is the enemy for these shields, um, both for capacity and for integrity. Um, one of the collaborators on the project I mentioned at MIT is a group, Simulia, that's experts in computational fluid dynamics and particle modeling. And that modeling showed the importance 
of folding the shield so it covers tops and bottoms as well as sides. So this is an, a, a cheaply, quickly made all folded shield that works uh, much better. So um, go on, Zach. And then it, it's gone both into die cutting, but Zach has an open design aimed at batch machining through stacks of sheets. Yeah, to Neil's point, there's a lot of very subtle features uh, of this that uh, involve folding and interlocking that uh, prevent aerosols from getting in or going out. Um, so this spun off two projects. One was a quick effort um, to quickly rapid prototype tooling for embossed marking them. So we used laser micro machining and um, kind of made our, did our own letterpress um, to, to mark prototypes. Uh, and then the second one, as Neil alluded to, was a uh, kind of a fork of the Project Manus design that's designed uh, for the community. So um, this one has open free CAD files um, and it's designed around a uh, one eighth inch milling cutter. Uh, and the process we developed was basically you, you, you take as many sheets of plastic as you can fit on your shop bot and you screw them down with a piece of quarter inch HDPE and a bunch of drywall screws. You tool path it really carefully and then you cut them all in bulk. Um, and you're able, to, you're able to reach the same production throughput that we can on our laser cutter or our cutting and folding machine. So you can, you can make on the order of um, 60 to 80 face shields an hour if you have the materials. Um, what's nice about this is that every, every Fab Lab has a, has a shot pot and they can, it can handle uh, four by eight sheets of material. Um, so after that, we kind of moved on um, from face shields onto intubation boxes. So um, we call this the intubation station. It was inspired by a, a Taiwanese doctor um, in, in mid-March that came out with this to protect uh, medical workers that are doing intubations. Um, so we made this rigid design that uses milled HDPE panels and then a, a clear plastic folded shield. Um, and the feedback we got was that it was heavy and it was hard to assemble and there wasn't enough visibility. Uh, so Alfonso, who's not on the, on the call but specializes in uh, kind of the, the math and science of folding and is the expert at operating our cutting and folding machine, um, came up with this excellent design that uses um, this curved crease um, that gives, you can see kind of a, a, in this uh, intubation simulation trial we did, you can see the curved crease gives it a great deal of rigidity, um, but it still can be folded out of a single sheet of PETG, which means our, uh, our material cost is very low, they stack, they can be nested, they can be uh, kind of staged, they can be shipped flat. Um, so it's a really compelling design. Um, and this is this is one that right now we're we're going through IRB approval to do clinical trials at a few local hospitals. And, um, and the testing has been so important. Everything we've done has failed testing over and over and uh, it's been really important feedback. But once we go through it, then you can share and propagate. Yeah, so yeah the, the interesting thing we hear is that um, everybody everybody has like a kind of the certification level that they think is important. So if you if you talk to clinicians, they have a number of concerns that are very important and we need to comply with those. But then if you talk to the disinfection specialists, they have potentially somewhat different concerns. And if you, you know, do the airflow modeling and the simulation, you know, we need to also demonstrate efficacy there. So there's a lot of different stakeholders that we all, we kind of have to pull together very rapidly um, that feed into our iterations. Um, a few, few more minutes, Zach. Yep, yeah, so then the, um, this is fed into another project, which is uh, basically the same idea, but it um, uses a negative pressure ventilator um, to pull aerosols through a HEPA filter, just increasing the margin of safety. Um, and this is where we're really leaning on our, on our simulation capabilities to do um, sneeze and cough modeling. Um, and then the last one that we're just starting on right now okay, is... And that one is like a fume hood for a person, in effect. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, it, you know, briefly, um, between intubation and passive respiratory support, there's a whole host of respiratory support options like CPAP and BiPAP and nasal cannulas that are not available right now because um, they don't capture when the person is coughing or leaks around the mask. So a lot of hospitals are, are banning them. Um, and the idea behind a box like this is, well, we shouldn't intubate people that don't need to be intubated. We should unlock that capability again by providing sufficient levels of safety for the, for the personnel. Um, and this came out after a month of constant talk with doctors and, and other folks. You know, we, we really had to dig to find this to be what we think now is, is one of the keys to, to really um, addressing the problem for the frontline workers. Um, and then the final one working on is more electronic centric. Uh, we're going to try to uh, make a Fab Lab producible pulse ox sensor. So there's these um, ubiquitous uh, system on chip um, integrated uh, LED photodiode DAC systems. Um, we're going to we're going to build a version of that that's like a reference design that anybody can make. Um, they have a DigiKey catalog at 20 bucks and a 3D and The reason that's so important is this is transitioning to post peak pandemic where monitoring is going to be critical to deploy wide wide scale monitoring. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you, Zach. Okay, next Thank you, Zach. is another of uh, my students. Uh, 
there's been all sorts of versions of you can use blank as a filter material. And so Cameron's been tackling that. Cameron, take over the screen. You're muted, Cameron. All right, let me unmute. Um, let's see, this should be the correct screen to share. Good, got it. Um, yeah, so as Neil just said, I wanted to use some of the resources that we have in the lab specific to MIT to be able to aid in characterizing a lot of these DIY projects that are coming up around um, you know, making your own face masks at home, making um, different types of PPE for doctors to wear and whatnot. Um, and so to do that, basically, I did a bit of a deep dive into how the coronavirus um, virus actually travels through the air. And just kind of as an introduction, what I found most interesting was that the um, aerodynamic diameter of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that is what is causing coronavirus has these two distinct um, diameters where um, you know, you're, you're dealing with particles that are sub-micron when you're taking your masks on and off. So if you're in a space where you're breathing, um, it's like if doctors are in a space where you're breathing with lots of um, coronavirus, then they're becoming most exposed in the donning and doffing process of their PPE. Um, and that's just another reason why like the fume hood and some of the different types of PPE we're developing are um, useful. But basically what I've developed here at MIT is a um, filtration efficiency test setup. And so this is an apparatus designed to measure the filtration efficiency of different types of material along with the uh, pressure drop across the material. So what's important when you're making a face mask is not only how good it is at keeping particles in and out, um, but also how easily you can breathe through it and um, how well you, you know, not be breathing in your own carbon dioxide that you're exhaling every time. And what are you using for the virus surrogates? So for the virus surrogates, I'm um, using uh, like sub-micron gold colloidal particles that are being aerosolized in this nebulizer here. And so basically the setup is we've got some compressed air going through a HEPA filter, so we clean it out. It goes up to through these two valves. One of these valves is controlling just the overall air compression um, to control the pressure across the uh, Sorry, Cameron, media. Cameron, for time, we don't need Fast quite that pressure. much detail, yeah. but we should get to the imaging then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so from here, I'm developing, sorry, my Zoom is getting in the way. Um, I've developed a, I'm making a little filter media database. And so this is what's... And sorry, just to introduce that, Cameron is the keeper of a really interesting scanning electron microscope that can back pressure to deal with, uh, uh, fill with back pressure for uncoated samples to do this kind of imaging. Yeah, um, so here you can see that I've taken, for each of the different types of filter material that I'm testing in the testing apparatus, I've also taken SEM images of them. I'm trying to zoom in on this page here. So these are some examples of um, different types of filter material. If you click on the link here, this is all online and starting from the link that Neil shared initially. This is just your typical type of um, HVAC filter that you can buy at Target or any Home Depot and stuff. And so this is an example of some of the SEM images taken here. Um, and we can just visually compare them to um, an N95 mask, for example. And so you so, see so keep that- scrolling down to show some of the household materials. Yeah. Um, this one, yeah. The HEPA looks interesting. <laughs> Yeah, the HEPA filter is, is definitely the most interesting one to be seen. Um, so here's an example of a polyester uh, microfiber pillowcase. You can see that it's a uh, woven material and it's not randomly organized like the other filter materials. And so it would be less effective is the hypothesis at, um, at actually filtering out those nanoparticles. Um, here's an example of a cotton t-shirt it's just a like your typical Fruit of the Loom cotton t-shirt um, that is knit and you can see each of the knits here. Um, and then what is interesting is that the HEPA filter 
that has a much higher filtration efficiency than even an N95 mask is significantly different in its material makeup um, from the other types of household items. So and, and so we've also had projects looking at ways to actually produce these filter media, but what Cameron is doing should help sort of drain a swamp of what can be used for what purpose from, from casual to um, frontline virus. Yeah, infection. I'd like to work with you and create a popular version of this. Like a, what, you know, it's really interesting. I, I think, uh, uh, you know, one of the things earlier on your, uh, that I wanna, that I came across and wrote about uh, Stephanie Paceman was, was doing some research, but the difficulty of testing, um, you know, the materials uh, for masks uh, is, is like, you know, the only way to do it is to pay thousands of tens of thousands right. so of dollars testing for has testing. Been a big part. Another thing we've been doing a lot of work on is there have been a lot of versions of 3D printing swabs and other ways to make swabs. Right. And we've done a lot of work on testing the swabs. Oh, that's interesting. That's a good yeah. story okay. too. So, um, okay, thanks, thank you, Cameron. Cameron. Yeah. So then uh, next two we're going to go to our two colleagues have been doing a really good job of community labs, but also connecting with the research project. So first let's go to Tim at Artisans Asylum. Tim, you're muted. Uh, let me switch my share here. So we have a, we're a 40,000 square foot maker space. We're actually um, founded by Guy Cavalcanti, who started the uh, open source community um, medical, medical supply. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, and we've been working on a few different open source designs. We're mostly fixed, focused on shields, gowns, and working on a mask machine. Uh, so we're, you know, typically a dirty fabrication environment, um, but we've managed to come in and uh, develop a, a way to cleanly produce these, um, these different sorts of PPE. To date, we've uh, delivered 3,400 face shields and 3,200 hospital gowns. Um, the last week we've really scaled up. We now have 170 volunteers. 70% uh, of them are not members. Um, zero have reported COVID contacts. So we've really found a way to branch out into the community. Um, there are so many people who are willing to, to help, uh, but we've also worked with 10 different organizations that are purchasing PPE from us. And these are smaller com um, community organizations. Uh, you know. Uh, folks that work with foster homes, veterans agencies, um, and different groups of people that, uh, that are not able to access conventional supply chain. So on the one end, I meet every week with um, Mass General Hospital, Brigham and Women surgeons who have uh, amazing clinical expertise and guidance, uh, but they also have the purchasing power that as soon as 3M has an N95 mask available, they're going to get it. But there is this whole other side of demand for healthcare workers who are not working for these well-heeled organizations. Um, so we've tried to develop things that are more cost-effective and more available. Tim, can you show um, the, the mask folder as an example? Sure. Uh, so I'll just share a little video here. Um, I've been uh, using a 3D printer. Um, you know, as Neil said, it's not scalable for actually pr for printing PPE directly, but 3D printers are great for prototyping tools. So I came up with a variety of different ways to form the pleats and folds needed in a, in a pleated surgical mask. And all of this is um, posted open source up on my yeah. GitHub. And so, so I think like, this is an example, again, of not running your 3D printer to save the world, but you're really intelligently using it to de design something that does something really useful. Yeah, um, and I've actually uh, delivered these parts to a couple different factories who are interested in producing their own um, machines and this is sort of the power of, of open source design is that once you have a um, once you have the bits that work well uh, anybody can reproduce these so I've spoken with a number of um, groups around the world yeah. who are printing their own and I've printed and delivered parts to uh, some people who are not able to fabricate Do you have something you can show then on the gown ultrasonic uh, welding yes uh, so this is one of our members, uh, Pastry Queen. Um, we were lucky enough to get our hands on this ultrasonic machine that was, uh, you know, mothballed at MIT. Yeah, so, so uh, just to unpack that, this was a tool we had that was just sleeping in our basement cage that we weren't using, um, an ultrasonic uh, bonder that we didn't have a good use for. And um, I forget who contacted who, but it ended up going to them and then this wonderful story of how they're using it. 
Yeah, uh, and it really lets you fly through material. Um, we're using non-woven polypropylene, uh, as as most are for for gowns, um, and it's a you know you wouldn't want to sew it. It's possible to heat bond it, and we're doing that as well with impulse sealers. But ultrasonics are are really the proper tool, um, but they're incredibly expensive. So uh, and you know they're hard to come by at this point. I just purchased six on eBay and I kind of feel like they're the last six available in the country. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really incredible the way this response has allowed us to get access to resources, tools, um, and most importantly, get access to brains that otherwise we wouldn't have. Been Great. Able to. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Danny, take over the screen. So um, Danny is a Fab Labber guru from the Bay Area, um, and he's done a really interesting job of building a level of structure above individual DIY, Danny. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, I have been building Fab Labs uh, around the Bay Area for a while, mostly tied to education, um, and I was poised to kind of jump on this opportunity after I had ignored it effectively for a few days. Uh, and and jumped in and was able to basically step in and kind of um, so I'm I'm not representing one lab or one one group of people I'm I'm actually representing a large number of of different groups around both small manufacturers fab labs community maker spaces etc and uh, I quickly kind of stepped into um, the the work identifying some of the biggest concerns which were where do you get your raw materials and who's paying for it. Um, and realize that if you can address those two two big concerns right away, you can allow the people that have production capacity to do just that to, to produce. Um, and so uh, I quickly put all my efforts into one helping to corral people together on on a kind of area focused team uh, that's looking at multiple products, uh, and uh, and then uh, begin to help collectively fundraise. We've brought in thirty grand, which is not a huge amount of money, but uh, we've also brought in 50,000 pounds of plastic we got donated from Coca-Cola um, and about 15,000 yards of fabric for both gowns and mass production. Um, and we've used uh, one of the fab labs here to essentially build a, fact a mask making factory uh, for cotton masks um, using CNC machine and, and kind of a, uh, a track saw jig for fabric saws. Uh, we're able to cut all of our pieces at scale very quickly. Uh, and then we've been packing those up and sending them out to uh, people with sewing machines at their, at their houses to sew them and then bringing them back and doing kind of a final uh, QC and, and shipping on them. Uh, and same as uh, um, uh, those in, in uh, Somerville area, uh, we've uh, spun up gown production as well, but we, we're doing uh, polyester uh, cotton blend, uh, working with a, a local production uh, cut house to do so. Um, <clears throat> So we've just kind of been very active in, in moving these things around. Um, and uh, with, the, with the plastic that we've brought in, um, not all of it yet has been converted to uh, shields because it was about um, 45,000 pounds was, was this last shipment of it. Um, uh, we've uh, helped ship that out now West Coast wide uh, around uh, to uh, Southern California, Pacific Northwest, uh, Arizona, and Colorado. Um, so we're so, helping- uh, Danny, for time- with that. Um, Danny, for time, comment on your thoughts on the sustainable financial model. Um, yeah, so so uh, what we're doing, and we're actually just started it uh, starting this week, is now um, because we've been uh, successful at bringing in a lot of uh, materials donations, we uh, are utilizing the funds we've raised, or at least a, a good chunk of it, to actually pay the people who are doing kind of the active work. Uh, still leading groups of volunteers, but uh, we're paying people this week. Um, we, we've decided to run this through a cooperative staffing agency that I have a, a partnership with. Um, and you know, have an intention of of trying to hold over some portion of this work uh, past this this current crisis, um, uh, and utilizing that kind of cooperative business model as a as a tool of, to emerge out of all of this work. So I wanted to underscore that this idea of building a worker-owned cooperative out of this initiative um, is a really important consequence. Okay, yeah, thanks, Dan. Really nice idea, Dan. Thank yeah. you. Um, uh, Lass, can you take over? Mute. All right, then. Well, Dale uh, and everyone out there, thank you. 
thank you so much actually for inviting uh, inviting us all to be a part of this. I love the uh, the title Plan C. I think that is like really cool <laughs> because it says so much, right? It says so much about, you know, it says so much about, uh, you know, manufacturing and money and, you know, where are all the resources going and where aren't they going and, and you know, what, are, what is the giant void that we are filling and fulfilling, right? So, um, at any rate, um, I'm, I'm fab lass is what, what they kind of call me in the network. And I used to make things, but now I make organizations and collaborations and money more than anything. <laughs> so I kind of miss the making, but I really like support the, supporting the making. And so um, we started the foundation back in 2009. So we're just over 10 years old now. And it really was to, um, you know, provide uh, access to the tools uh, for technology in innovation and invention right and give everyone democratize access to these tools and so so i've been spending the last 10 years or so of, as we all have uh you know really trying to get these tools into the hands of everyone and as neil was talking about you know and and dale the the promise of digital fabrication has always been that we could create resilient uh self-sufficient um communities and um and what's happening right now in the midst of this horrible pandemic is some proof uh, that this is really that, that this really can work and and how we can as makers uh, rise to the needs of our community and help sustain our community so um, at the fab foundation we work in education we work in sort of the dot org or social um, social impact and then uh, we we try to also support um, businesses right and uh, entrepreneurs as they're uh, coming out in the world so sorry let's see okay uh, so this is, uh, these are a couple of maps. The, this, this map here is the global fab lab network. We're about 2000 labs in 120 some odd countries. They're about, uh, if you add that to this wonderful map that Anna Waldman Brown and her team put together, uh, several years ago, uh, to all the maker spaces and, um, uh, you know, um, hacker spaces uh, uh, together, you know, we've got thousands and thousands of facilities around the world that share the same tools and processes. And, um, you know, and when I talk about the same tools and processes, I'm really talking about computer you know, computer design tools and computer controlled manufacturing tools and electronics and programming. And that's, and these, this is an infrastructure that many, many of us in the, uh, in the network, in both, in all the networks, um, uh, uh, share and so we can leverage this for everything right for education for social impact etc and this is where we're seeing it happen right um, this is just about the fact that our uh, our organizational work is about public private partnerships um, and they're both national and global so we build labs all over the world with organizations like Dasso uh, we do educational programs and build labs in the United States with Chevron with GE we work with the National Governors Association on you know what you know, on what the future of workforce, what the future workforce and the education for that workforce looks like. And of course, as Neil mentioned, we, uh, we're working on the National Fab Lab Network Act, which is for fab labs and makerspaces and uh, hackerspaces uh, to become part of, you know, the, the public-private partnership that supports communities, right? So um, we were super, I, you know, I have been so impressed as I've seen um, you know, as I've seen what's happening in this, uh, you know, as the pandemic um, spreads uh, and how our community, our communities are really pulling together and helping. And they're really, really filling a niche. They filled a niche initially, you know, that the large scale manufacturers couldn't. And now that the large scale manufacturers are kind of catching up, we're fulfilling actually other really important needs, which are very local uh, and very distributed and very customized and, um, uh, and, and, that, and, and very needed as well. And so we've just been overwhelmed in a wonderful way by the, innovation that is happening uh, throughout uh, the maker movement. It's just, it's extraordinary. And, but, but one of the downsides is that, you know, uh, most of our maker spaces and fab labs are, are doing this almost gratis, right? We're, we're paying for materials, but, uh, you know, we, we aren't able to pay, say, labor or for our lab time or for any of the overhead expenses. And many times we have to, uh, we have to, uh, 
charge prices that are, um, you know, less are, are equal to what the large scale manufacturers do uh, are charging, you know, to hospitals. Otherwise, we're kind of seen as highway robbers. And, um, and, and that's not sustainable. And so for me, personally, I would really, really like to find a way uh, or find ways to either subsidize or make this sustainable kind of like um, in the ways that Danny is working uh, out in Oakland. Um, mm. But uh, 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 in spe specifically how the uh, Fab Foundation is kind of supporting this, um, we, we're, uh, we're doing some partnerships right now where, you know, all of these relationships are like six weeks old or less, right? So these are all happening really fast and, and really uh, have, we have to be flexible and we have to really listen to hear what the network needs and what the networks need and want. So uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're working with um, uh, the open source medical um, supplies, nation of makers, uh, even shift seven, which I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure you can see this, <laughs> but uh, uh, on, on sort of, uh, trying to find, trying to provide resources to these networks um, that will help them get from idea to, you know, tested uh, uh, prototypes to, a, to prototypes that have been approved, to uh, small scale manufacturing supply chain, to distribution and or um, working with the communities of, uh, around what happens after. You know, what happens when, you know, a lot of these spaces, because they're, they can't make money right now, and uh, they're certainly not making money, you know, creating PPE, what do you do after? What happens after and how do you support the communities and the safe and wonderful creative spaces uh, that, they've, that they created? How do you help them after the fact? Uh, so we also- last, uh, Time yeah, check, we have I've to got, get to Megan. Yes. Um, yep. I'm almost done. So I'm working with, uh, we're working locally with Artisans Asylum and FAB at CIC to uh, loan our equipment. We don't have our own space, but we loan out our, uh, our FAB Lab equipment to these spaces so they can make PPE. Uh, the, one of the big things that we're doing right now is uh, fiscal sponsorships. We, uh, we're uh, doing free fiscal sponsorships for uh, uh, COVID-related um, projects. So if you are not a nonprofit and you have a, uh, you know, you have really amazing PPE that you want to put out in your community and you need somebody to, uh, a 501c3 to do, to help you, um, then I can do that. Uh, we're also distributing about uh, 8,000 masks and shields to Native American communities, both in Massachusetts and out West. Uh, that's along with a group called Fab Lab Hub. So that's some of the things that we're doing. Um, please, if you want help or if you want to uh, I'm looking for masks, actually, for great mask designs. Um, so if you are already producing them, if you would contact me, because uh, we would probably like to distribute them. And also, if you would like to uh, participate or a fiscal sponsorship or whatever, please contact me. Okay. okay. Thank you, Thanks, Sherry. Sherry. And then before we get to the q and uh, I'm very happy to have joining us is Megan Smith, who, among other things, uh, was Oops, the Obama yeah. your, uh, CTO. Um, in this flow, it's progressed most immediately from PPE, then from PPE, a lot of work, as we discussed some of on testing. From testing, it's progressing to really interesting solutions for respiratory assistance. But the real promise ultimately of making is um, building back better, is, is the post-pandemic response. So Megan? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Megan Smith. I'm at Shift7 now, uh, partner with FabLab on many things. And uh, I'm also on the MIT board, so I'm like always bothering Neil and visiting him at MIT. Um, I guess what I wanted to share was, uh, first off, Neil, you said about sort of the arts together. And I want to share that President Washington, in the very first State of the Union, I put the quote in the chat, um, he said to Congress, there is nothing which better deserves your patronage than science and literature and that knowledge uh, in every country is the surest basis of public happiness. So what I think about Fab Lab and our whole maker movement is about confidence and about inclusion. And I think about the two George Washingtons, one was the president, the other is George Washington Carver, who had the same idea as us. Uh, he took the train from Tuskegee, uh, to Tuskegee to join Booker T. Washington uh, from Missouri, and he saw how malnourished everybody was. And he saw that we were a monocrop culture. And he went straight into his Center for Bits and Atoms of the day, like Neil, 
And he just started working with his students. I'm like, okay, what are we gonna do? How could we rotate crops? He's, you know, you think of George Washington Carver because he got taught, he's the peanut guy. Well, he's really like, how about we rotate crops and how about now? Let's nitrogen fix the soil. Um, uh, and it's just an incredible story. He got funded by a venture capitalist named Jessup. And he went all around the country training and teaching farmers so they would be in the money for rotating crops. And above the Secretary of Agriculture's desk is a beautiful drawing of Carver and Secretary Wallace of the day, which is ag extension, you know, the scaling of it, which I see us, you know, in their way, what's needed at the time. And so of course the fab community immediately responded um, the, also the civic tech community, and I, I shared a lot of links in the side. I also wanted to share something else, which is on the USCTO coin, which we have. Um, it has the president's uh, symbol, but it also says something really interesting from history, which is uh, in the Liberty coin, in the US coins, they say liberty about freedom, right? But they actually, they, the first one from Franklin and Jefferson and Washington said liberty is the parent of science and industry. And that the idea of freedom and science and industry go together. I got to give the MIT commencement and I told the students that um, really in its best form, science, technology, innovation, all this stuff's about love. It's about love of obsession, like curiosity, like how, what's happening in this universe? How does this work? What is the atom? What is this, our world we're in? And the second part is like service, like engineering, making things for each other through the arts and engineering. And the third to me is community, which is all of what this is. And so we at our Shift 7 team is just us continuing from White House work, getting exposed to topics beyond the classics, the classic tech topics of robotics and self-driving cars and precision medicine and those things, but why not tech for justice and tech for equality and tech for the pay gap and tech for solving for foster care kids. And like, why wouldn't data science and big data be for any of these things and justice and inclusion? And I think that this, this network is really about, um, like we think shift to 7 billion colleagues, like how about everybody? And we can really solve nearly everything in our neo speak um, if we included everyone. So the work that I've been mostly doing with everyone is just routing and connecting people. There's work like the PPE coalition folks and, and a lot of people routing, um, just like the makers, people routing supply and figuring that out. There's the Neighborhood Express teams, which are helping neighbors bring food to each other. There's the US, United States Digital Response, US Digital Response, which is now 4,500 um, innovators. There's links on the left under Civic Tech. Um, they are doing innovation. Any government can go on the web page of usdigitalresponse.org and say that you've got a challenge. You know, I, I need COBO programmers. I need whatever. I need to make a form. Help me. And so people are rapidly helping New Jersey and Chicago and that's civic tech. I'm wearing this shirt for you guys. It's uh, some high school students saw us in government as civic techies. And they said, oh, we thought we could only do startups and those big companies. And we said, no, you could serve your fellow citizen. And so this idea of civic tech and nonprofit tech is, is here, it's coming, and it's actually really growing like crazy because of COVID. So I'll, I'll end there other than sharing that we do the United Nations Solution Summit. And um, the one thing that I'm really proud that we achieved, my one of my co-founders, Susan Alsner, is the key person here in doing that, is an open participatory collaborative um, selection process. And it ends in a totally gender balanced, race balanced, geo balanced, topic balanced set of innovators who take the stage at the UN uh, every year. And we know how to do that. So just think of everyone as a teammate. Thanks, guys. So, thanks, Megan. As, uh, let's see, am I, okay, yeah, I'm not muted. As we transition to the Q&A, um, let me start by observing, it's been a real, joy working with everybody on this call. Um, you know, one of the lessons to take from this session is, is avoid false dichotomies. The pandemic has driven collaborations in a really remarkable way. So it's not Fab Labs versus hackerspaces versus makerspaces versus tech shops. It's not academia versus industry. The successes come when we really figure out how all these groups can collaborate together. And in particular, to fill in um, holes in that map, holes between one person doing DIY and just volume manufacturing. And um, the last month has driven collaborations unlike um, anything I've seen. Everybody has to give up something to be part of them and then gets much more out of it. Yeah, so thank you, that, Neil. Sir, what, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Neil. Um, Dorothy, uh, you had a question um, I thought was a good one that you put in the chat, but why don't you s s say it? Uh, 
This is Dorothy uh, Jones Davis, Nation of Makers. Uh, miss, missed her at the beginning because of uh, maybe yeah, no the worries. lost the invitation, but <laughs> glad to have you. But I'm here. Um, uh, so first of all, I want to say like, wow, I'm just, I'm again, continually astounded by everything that everyone's doing. And Megan, I share that sort of everyone included um, really coming up with solutions together uh, is the way to go. Um, so I really appreciate you calling that out because I think that that's not just a, a nice thing. It's a necessity and it's really the only way to success um, for our entire country. You're here um, in the world, so, <laughs> so preach on. <laughs> um, but I, my question was actually geared to, uh, to, to Neil or, or to the research group. Um, so there's so many amazing things that obviously happen um, coming out of the, the bench uh, you know, around the country, including what's happening at MIT. How do we make sure that the makers um, that could benefit from these um, innovations that are happening in the lab get the information in a timely fashion? What's the best way to sort of um, figure out how we can communicate um, the best practices that are coming directly out of the lab. I mean, I, I know you guys are working really nimbly in the in the um, Boston area, but how do we get it out of Boston and Cambridge to the rest of the world um, beyond just the beyond just the Fab Lab network? So thinking towards the, the maker that may not be engaged in the Fab so Network. Can, can I give you a, an assignment? Of course. <laughs> it, it's the following. So. When this started, I set up two projects. One is the research project. The research project isn't just the Boston area. It grew out of CBA, but now it's an you know, international one. Um, that's been taking a lot of my time and attention to, to shepherd that thread. And a whole bunch of things have come through that pipeline. And I want to keep repeating, it's not just PPE. It's PPE to testing to respiratory assistance. Right now, that's working, and that's a lot of my time and attention. I had set up a corresponding a project aimed at leveraging the whole global fab network. Um, that one has some successes, um, but it's not being managed as intensely. And I've talked to Sherry, I've talked to Megan, it needs something like what I've been doing in the first project, which is a weekly sync, mm -hmm. where you have, you know, for better or worse, uh, for Zoom concerns, its infrastructure scales to hundreds of connections. There's a disciplined exercise to curate weekly gathering um, to synchronize. And that hasn't yet happened. There, there are lots of fragmented projects, and there's a few projects that have uh, 10,000, but the each week needs to be organized. And uh, the, the potential assignment would be to work with Megan and Sherry and everybody else um, to pull, pull together a weekly gathering for that kind of course. Actually, it is happening. I was going to say, <laughs> Oh, the coalition sorry. work, Sherry, because I think we have a, a to-do item on the coalition. We do, we do. Yeah, Sherry, but it's, 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 no, this is partially happening already, though, uh, at least with the Latin network. So South America, uh, Central America are doing a beautiful job of this, and now what we're trying to do is broaden that to the, the rest of us, right? <laughs> so it's partially happening, Neil. Okay. We just say... If yeah. it's to put it in the chat, or uh, if you want to raise your hand, we could bring you in and you could ask it in person. Um, so, um, in about 10 minutes. There's also a bunch of, let's see, there's a bunch of questions in the q and I think some yeah. have gone away. Um, just to quickly zip through some of them. Somebody was asking how much PPE we have made. One example of that is um, the shield Zach showed we went right from the prototyping to we found there was a lot of unused die cutting capacity of companies that do die cutting. Uh, and so that's gone into like the millions. It's, it, it's gone a few orders of magnitude above DIY prototyping by taking advantage of unused industrial capacity. Um, let's see, I'm just skimming through the questions here. Um, Lars is asking about GitLab. I'm religious about GitLab. Issue tracking in GitLab and shared distributed repos is, is the single best project management tool. Um, there was a question I think somebody posted that was deleted one or two about like, do you have to be a Fab Lab? And uh, th this is about access to tools. The Fab Lab network, you know, there's coordination infrastructure and shared capacity, um, but, but this isn't a matter of, about which kind of tool you have. There was a question about a, a misperception that our message is DIY can't do anything. Um, Lars's, uh, Tim's example of the mask is a really good example of 3D printing um, 
bands for shields we found is just a bad idea. It doesn't work well and it doesn't scale well. Tim's machine to make a local machine to do mass production in your community is a fabulous example of a 3D printer. Um, the point is not that it's not useful, but that it's, you know, it's building on all the experience we've been talking about to make good use of all of that. Um, there was a question for Cameron about a filter, filter media for that to Cameron. Um, about how sorry, you're saying bad idea under... there. Not, yeah, not, not, you're right, bad, it's not a bad idea. Well, but let's see, the, the shading is some of the stuff that's been done under 3D printing we found is actually dangerous. It traps particles and it, it, it actually gives a sense of protection when it doesn't. And so there's not scalable, but there's also things that actually have been on just actually unsafe. That's why this sort of collaboration is so important. Yeah. Um, let's see, ventilators, way too many ventilators projects. Like roughly every day I'm approached about somebody's yeah. new ventilator project. Um, there are a bunch of issues with them. One issue is a ventilator is much more than something that goes in and out. The ventilator has to be carefully managed um, yeah. by a skilled, uh, person or really good machine intelligence. Otherwise, it does more harm than good. There's a lot of evidence that most patients on ventilators end up dying. And um, what's needed comes long before the ventilator with other kinds of respiratory assistance. Um, it, it, Neil, could you talk about the 3D printed swabs? Because that, uh, that's, that's been kind of interesting. Uh, and whether those designs are open and whether you know, yeah, so, uh, the, um, the, the work around that. Yeah, and by the way, in the questions, please don't delete questions or consider them sensitive. There's nothing sensitive in what we're talking They're about. They're not, they just get answered and moved from open to answered or dismissed, ah, okay. I see. Good. Okay, um, swabs, uh, uh, swab production isn't keeping up with demand. Uh, there are a few attempts at FDM printed swabs and they just weren't very good. They, they the, the, the swab has to do, three things. It has to hold mucus, it has to scrape cells, and it has to be elastic, elastic but strong enough to follow the painful path uh, to collect all of that. Um, uh, one of the people originally on the agenda, before I noticed it was 1 a.m. in Belgium, has been working on printing swabs and doing A-B testing in a hospital, um, Nicolas, and they had a pretty good design um, uh, that, that was matching the testing against existing swabs. But right now, the most interesting swab things is there's a couple groups. There's Form Labs, um, there's uh, G Phase group, uh, there's uh, Avi Reichenthal's group, all doing um, STL, with the distinction is STL does uh, just as making higher resolution features than FDM. And they're all using interesting materials, and we've helped them on the testing of the materials. And they've made really beautiful, complex shapes that can simultaneously hold mucus, scrape cells, and fold to follow the nasal path. Um, and they're all scaling up their production capacity. And so that's an example where the printing is really relevant for swabs, but it needs more than just a, a DIY FDM printer to make them at the feature size you need. And it actually looks like in that case, um, the production capacity can be scaled by parallelizing. But note, one of the biggest issues there is to get them into the medical system, a real sensitivity is you can talk to a frontline provider who thinks it's great, but there's a couple levels of sign off before, beyond that before it can go into a hospital. And a lot of work has gone into um, the food, you know, the medical grade resins and then the levels of sign off to get the approval. And one of the things Megan has been looking into helping is sharing those so that one, when, when, a particular swab design with a particular set of materials has been approved by one kind of regulatory chain. It doesn't immediately couple to other ones and being able to share those. Yeah. Um, have, you, have you been involved at all with any sort of the government side of uh, a regulatory chain? So, yeah. So one of the interesting things is uh, an FDA person has been joining these calls and her point role is essentially to, to break the FDA rules for sort of things that don't fit traditional FDA approval. She said, I'm the state can't go. And just for give all her projects to her, but she's been very constructive in doing that. It's good um, to hear. 
you know, a, another example is, is the Defense Act that hasn't been in, invoked since the last war of bringing in national capacity. And the point person on additive manufacturing for that is a colleague at DARPA, Jan Vandenbrun, who's really thoughtful, is really interesting. And again, he's been very active in this and looking at how you know, the government can constructively collaborate. I do think, you know, a, along with, um, so yeah, I mean, in the to-dos, it, it's not hard to find the innovators. A lot of what's rate limiting is the organizational innovators, the people who build organizational capacity, like, like many of the people on this call. A, a lot of what's needed at this stage is building that sort of meso scale, not top down and not bottom up, but exactly between those. Likewise, there's a valley of funding depth, where there's, there's the prototyping and the scaling, and it's been hard to cover what's in between. And one of the issues is any one of the people is too small for many of the funders. And one of the opportunities, and so I'd give, I'd give you another job if I can, <laughs> which is to think about how to bundle all of this into a really big proposal that can fund this you know, collectively, not in lots of little slices. Yeah, that's a important. Neil, the only thing I'd add about that, like what you're talking about, the organizing, it's I sometimes call it the glue layer teammates, the people who organize TEDx, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's also capacity building inside of the like, government, like we were doing. And one of the things you need when you're doing that is people people who give you agency, people who help you, because we're talking across different disciplines. And so we can, we, you know, as a techie, I can be very annoying to somebody who's trying to fix something uh, like school lunch and they know way more than I do. And it's not about some app for that or whatever. It's about really listening to them and teaming really in a deeply respectful way, seeing with them and then seeing where you can make something faster, better, whatever, with their genius, it's collective genius. And you can do that if they'll welcome you. You also can do that if there's people like, we had President Obama, we had Dennis McDonough as chief of staff, people who in the room, when people kind of move away from your idea, they kind of lean back and say, what was it you guys were saying? And what do you guys think? How might we, because you're trying to bring together disparate um, skill sets that have not had the practice So this government, which is the richest thing in the world, is a huge way to scale. So really encourage people to find people who help you, someone in the room, help you bring your idea into these other spaces. Those kind of people with agency can help a lot. And as we get towards eight o'clock and wrapping up, in, in, skate to where the puck is to, to belabor or overuse aphorisms. Um, in, in some ways, the most important thing on the call was uh, uh, Danny talking about worker-owned cooperative and Tim talking about the hundred people with the local business model. Um, there's a real opportunity. You know, the economy is broken. Jobs are broken. Companies are broken. There's a real opportunity now to rebuild differently. Yeah. And a lot of the immediate medical needs are getting met. They don't need Hero 3D printers to make another ventilator but figuring out how we restart the country and do yeah. it in a way that's better integrated with what we believe in, that, that's the real, real opportunity. And yeah, I'd really- I, I, I agree. And some of it is actually getting our government to do things it should do. And, uh, and also to empower you know, people to do things in, in these groups and in the kinds of organizations we're seeing come up. But listen, let me, let me uh, approach a wrap up here. Uh, let me thank, you, thank Megan and Sherry and Danny uh, Dorothy, of course, and Cameron, uh, Tim, and, and Zach, and of course, Neil uh, Gershenfeld. Um, thank you all for sharing with us. We'll uh, do a video, uh, put this up as a video. Others who couldn't join us today will see it. Um, it's a great overview, and I'd love to drill down on a lot of what I see in here, but it's a, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share all of this uh, with others. Thank you very much. Thanks for what you do, and I look forward to seeing everybody through all these ways to follow up and, and to pick up on the homework from the sessions. Yeah. We'll definitely great. do the homework. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone from the Fab Lab. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.